may be seated. Uh, Father God, we just uh, are here in awe of your goodness. Uh, Father, there is nothing uh, good or redeemable or lovable about us in your eyes. We were all rebels. Uh, we were all sinners. Uh, we were all enemies of your throne. We were unrighteous. We were unredeemed. The Bible says that our righteousness was but bloody, filthy rags in your sight. And the Bible says that none of us were good. No, not one. That no one was looking for you. But in your goodness, Father, before we even sinned, before we even were born, you made a wonderful plan of redemption through our Lord and Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you love us and value us so much that you are preparing a place in heaven for us, that you gave us your all, that you sent Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross for us. Thank you, Father, and we know that according to your will, that in your goodness, that we are loved, that we are valued, that we have a purpose. And so, Father, we just stand in awe again of your goodness. And then, Father, because of Jesus, we now can have that relationship with you. Father, I ask that you just uh, minister to us today. Just speak through me. Lord, have your way in me and with me and through me. And uh, just teach us all uh, today, Lord, a little bit more about it, our war against our enemy. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, in case you're keeping track, and some of you are not, I know, but this is the 11th Sunday in a row that I have been discussing spiritual war, the war that we find ourselves in. All right, church, if you've been here, you know that we are at war. We are at war with Satan and every other evil spirit and demonic entity in existence. And in this war, we have all been attacked. We have been attacked spiritually, we have been attacked mentally, we have even been attacked physically, all right? So many, you don't even understand how so many of the hardships that we have endured, the problems that we have faced have come about because we are at war with an enemy who hates us. But before I get started talking more about this war, I want to just pause, and I don't want you to make the mistake, okay? Don't make the mistake of blaming the devil and demons for every problem and hardship in your life and in the lives around you, okay? Everything is not the devil's fault. A lot of times, it's your own fault, okay? It's your fault. It's my fault, all right? Or we're victim of the sinful heart of someone else. The truth is, we are a broken, sinful people who live in a broken, sinful world. So even if Satan and his demonic army didn't exist our lives would still be full of trials and tribulation, okay? There would still be suffering and hardships, and the evening news would still be filled with bad stories, okay? But we have all of that, and on top of that, we have an enemy that hates us, okay? We, yes, some of our problems have been, or we're facing due to poor decisions and choices on our part, and we're victims of others, but you also need to be aware that you do have a spiritual enemy who hates you, whose mission in his life is to steal, kill, and destroy. He is an enemy who can really make a mess of your life if you let him. Church, we are at war. We are at war with an enemy who hates us, an enemy who has an army incalculable in size, and an enemy that doesn't need to rest or sleep, an enemy that is stronger than us, an enemy that is the ruler of this age that we live in, an enemy that has power over the governments and businesses and organizations and people. And this enemy wants to destroy you and break apart us, the church, in every possible way. And let me tell you, I told you before, and I'll tell you again. If you try to run away from this war, you will lose. If you try to fight on your own, you will lose. If you try to fight unprepared, you will lose. But Christians, this morning, I wanted you to remember some things. I want you to remember that you are not alone. 
I want you to remember that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have God's Word, the Bible right there beside you. And you have your church family beside you. All right? Amen? Also, I have several other things that I want you to remember. Things that will remind you that if you are prepared for war, not only will you survive it, but you will win it. So HBC, let, let me ask you this morning, do you want to win your spiritual battles? All right, you, you do, right? Do you want Satan and his minions fleeing in defeat? All right, do you want to be victorious in war? Amen. Well, if you do, you need to remember the things that I'm going to talk about today in the next couple of weeks, all right? Today, I'm going to start with you after talking about all the bad stuff and the enemy and his power and what he's doing. We transitioned on Resurrection Sunday, talking about Jesus' victory, and now we're going to be talking about the keys of victory, all right? So, I'm going to give you the keys of victory. Here are the things to remember. First thing you need to remember is this. Remember to rest in your identity in Christ, all right? On my message on Palm Sunday, if you remember, we looked at Satan's temptation of Je Jesus in the wilderness. And if you remember, Satan kept saying a little word that I didn't like, right? That little word was if. When God had already declared Jesus with a word that was is, God said, this is my son. While Satan tried to question Jesus' identity by saying, if, if you are the Son of God, if you are really who you claim to be, Satan put a question mark where God had put a period. And let me tell you something, if he did that with Jesus, he's going to do it with you and me. He's going to make us question where God has periods and exclamation marks. Satan is going to come with a question mark. So if you want to win your spiritual battles, you need to remember who you are. And let me tell you who you are. If you are a born-again believer, you are one of God's own. You are a, one of God's children. You are a part of the bride of Christ. You are part of the body of Christ. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. Amen? That is what God has declared. If you are a follower of Jesus, it really doesn't matter what you declare. It matters what God declares. And He declares your identity as being in Jesus. Now, the Bible is filled with these identity-given verses. God's Word tells us followers of Jesus time and time again, all right? I'm going to just share with you this morning a few of the dozens of verses that talk about our identity in Jesus, all right? Now, I'm going to go fast. You won't even have time to flip through them, so if you won't, you can just write down the Scripture reference, all right? Listen to Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes, listen to this, one spirit with him. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, 10, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Galatians 3, 26, for in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. Ephesians 1, 4, even as he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Hebrews 2, 11, for both he who sanctifies, that is Jesus, and those who are being sanctified, that is us, are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them 
brethren. And let me give you just one more verse, and I really love this one because it goes with our theme of being in war. It reminds us of the outcome of the war because of our identity in Jesus. And you all know this one, Romans 8, 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Amen? Your identity, my identity is in Christ. Do you understand what that means? Do you understand what that means? Do you understand the significance and the power behind the truth in your identity? Do you understand what it means to be one with someone, to be united with someone, to have your identity in another? It means that whatever they have, you have. It means whatever they own, you own. It means whatever they are, you are. For instance, we know that when a man and woman comes together in holy matrimony, the Bible says that they have become one flesh. They become one. They become united. They get a new singular identity. And when it comes to our culture, it is often a tradition that the bride takes her husband's last name. And you know what that is? That name change is an identity statement. Let me ask you all something. Do you think I would just give any pretty woman a key to my house, put her in control of my money, Give her complete access to me 24-7 to protect her with my life, to raise a family with her, to love her unconditionally? Of course not. Not any pretty woman. Hey, pretty woman. You know, no, no, right? Of course not. The only pretty woman that has that right, that has that privilege is Christy. And why does she have that right? It is because we are one. It's because she identifies as a Johnson. It's because her identity is in me and my identity is in her. So that means all that I have is hers. All that she has is mine. It means she has all of me and I have all of her. Amen? Now, as you know, the church is the bride of Jesus. Church, you and me and every other believer has taken Jesus' name. We belong in His house. We have a key to the kingdom. All that He has, all that He is, is ours, and that is because we belong to Him. We are in Christ, amen? And so that means... All that he has is ours. All that he is is ours. So do you know why Satan cannot take away our salvation? It's because our salvation is in Jesus. Do you know why Satan cannot ruin our future? It's because our future is in Jesus. Do you know why Satan cannot defeat us? It is because our victory is in Jesus. It's in Him. So that's why we can't be defeated. That's why our salvation can't be taken from us. That's why we can't be ruined. It is His. So unless Christ loses, we can never lose. In Christ, it is impossible for Him to lose. Amen. He already has the victory. So the first key to winning your war against Satan is to rest, is to stand in your identity in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, are y'all with me today? We're a little sleepy today. I know we're a little sleepy, all right? The second thing you need to remember is this, all right? Something I told you last Sunday briefly. We're going to expand it a little bit today, all right? Number two, remember you are fighting from a place of victory and not for victory, all right? And that's a big difference, amen? Romans 8, 20, uh, 8, excuse me, 8.37, listen to it again. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I love how the New Living Translation uh, puts this verse. Listen to this. It says, overwhelming victory 
is ours through Christ who loved us. Isn't that amazing? Not just victory, overwhelming victory. Because of our relationship with Jesus, because of our identity in Jesus, we are more than conquerors. We have achieved an overwhelming victory through Jesus. Amen? But the question that naturally comes from this verse is this. What has Jesus conquered for us? What has Jesus given us victory over? Well, let's look at God's Word. Again, there's thousands of verses that tell us. I'm just going to give you a few. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says this. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, this is Jesus, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. So notice that through Jesus' death, he destroyed Satan and he freed us from the fear of death. Now without Christ, let me tell you, we should fear death. Without Christ, we should because death is a gateway to eternal damnation. And the truth is, death is something we will all face because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Is death. So since we are all sinners, we deserve, we have earned death. We have earned, we deserve hell. But through Jesus, we have been released from the bondage of death. And listen, we can only be released from the bondage of death if we have been freed from the bondage of sin. You with me? Because sin is punished by death, so if we're free from death, we have to be free from sin. So through Jesus, our sins have been forgiven. As Ephesians 1, 7 says, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of His grace. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So through Jesus, we have victory over sin, we have victory over death, and we have victory over Satan. Now, and I also want to just read to you because it's so good, Romans 6 5 through 11, all right? This tells us kind of in a nutshell the victory that we have in Jesus. Listen to this. Since we have been united with him in death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. When He died, He died once to break the power of sin, but now that He lives, He lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Ain't that it? Yes, amen, church. Church, Jesus has conquered sin, death, and Satan. Jesus has victory over sin, death, and Satan. So that means because of Jesus and through Him, we have conquered sin. It means we have conquered death. It means we have conquered Satan. So in other words, when it comes to your battle and war with Satan and other spiritual forces of evil, you don't need to fight for victory. You need to fight from a place of victory. In Jesus, you already have victory. In Jesus, you already are a conqueror. In Jesus, you already are a dragon slayer. So you just got to remember to keep on slaying. Keep on conquering. You already have the victory. Jesus has already won the war. You are just fighting a defeated foe who's not ready to tap out yet. 
you have already won the war. Now, these are kind of the two keys that I, I just briefly talked about last week, and I didn't get to expand, all right? So, they're the things you need to remember for the past two weeks, and I want to move on and share with you now, uh, the next couple weeks, I'm going to give you some war scripture that you need to learn, all right? This is for your battle. This is some scripture you need to memorize, and we're taking the truth of how to fight spiritual warfare through them, all right? So we're going to look at one verse today. It's, it's James 4, 7. It's going to be on the screen. This is one we all need to end up memorizing. I'm sure that 99% of you already know that, all right? Know this verse. And when we look at it, we're going to pick out two things, two more things to remember, all right? So let's look at God's Word. It says this, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Notice in this verse, we are, we are called to carry out two actions. We are to submit, and we are to what? Resist. We are to submit to God, and we are to resist the devil. So let me give you two more things to remember, two keys to win in your spiritual war, all right? The first thing in this verse that you need to remember to fight in your war with Satan is this. You need to remember to give God your everything. You need to remember to give God your everything. Listen to this. The first step in winning your spiritual war is not by fighting, but by surrendering, all right? The first step in fighting the devil is by surrendering to God. If you want to win this war, you need to totally and completely and wholeheartedly submit to God. You need to give Him your everything. I love how the NCV translation translates this verse. It says this, so give yourselves completely to God. Instead of submit, it says give yourselves completely to God. And what does it mean to submit to God? What does it mean to give yourself completely to God? What does it mean to give God your everything? It means to give Him your heart your mind, your body. It means to give Him your obedience, your allegiance, and your devotion. It means to give Him your will, your plans, your agenda, your desires, and your dreams. It means to give Him your time and your energy. It means giving Him and giving your whole life to Him and then living a life dedicated to bringing glory and honor to God. That is what it means to give God your everything. And that's what it means when, when pastors like me stand up and say, you need to live a life of worship. You need to live a life of obedience. You need to be a living sacrifice. What all of these mean is, hey, you need to submit to God. You need to give God your everything. You see, giving God your everything, submitting to Him, is how you fulfill God's greatest command, right? We all know God's greatest command for you and me. Jesus tells us in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Another translation adds to the fourth one, and with all of your strength. So as you do this, as you love Him with the totality of who you are, you are faithfully abiding in the Father's will. And that means you are securely in His protection. Listen to this. When you are on your knees before God in submission, your God stands up ready to fight on your behalf. You hear that? When you kneel down in submission to your God, your God stands off his throne ready to fight to you, for you. You see, if you refuse to submit to God, do you know what you're doing besides sinning? I mean, obviously not submitting to God and being obedient to him is a sin. But you know what you're doing in far as regards to your spiritual war? You're going to war alone. 
If you are not being faithful to God, if you're not in faithful standing with God, if you have gone outside of His will for your life, then don't expect Him to show up and fight your battles. We see this time and time again in the Old Testament. Think about it. When the Israelites were in God's will, they won every battle they ever fought. They never lost. Not once. However, during the times they went into battle while being unfaithful and disobedient to God, they never won. Not once. They always lost. For those of you who have been going through the yearly reading plan, that's about 80 of you, you have seen this time and time again. Whenever the ark of God and God leads them into battle, they win. Whenever they take the flag and say, no God, we're doing this on our own, they come on back with their hind parts whooped, right? They lose every time. When God's people are faithfully abiding in God's will, they win every battle they fight. When God's people are outside of His will and living in disobedience, they lose every battle. The truth is, if you go to battle without God, it doesn't matter if it's a physical war or this spiritual war. The result will be the same. He will not come and rescue you. It's not because He doesn't love you. He will allow you to get beat up and scuffed up and beat down because when that happens, that's when you come running back to Him, repenting. So listen, if you're being disobedient and you're fighting alone, He's going to let you fight alone. But if you are surrendered, if you are faithful, if you are obedient, if you are giving God yourself, if you are giving Him your everything, then you need to know you will not go into battle alone. And when God goes into battle with you, it is impossible for you to lose. Did you know that? It is impossible for you to lose. When God goes into battle with you, it's impossible for you to be defeated. Your victory is a guarantee. So if you want to win the spiritual war that you find yourselves in, submit to God. Give Him your everything. Give Him all of you. Now let's look at the rest of James 4, 7, all right? It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the last point I want to share with you is this. Remember that you are part of the resistance. How many of you, show of hands, have ever had or been in an above-ground pool? Anybody? All right. A lot of you have been in an above-ground pool, all right? And how many of you have ever created a whirlpool, right? Yes. Me and my family kids, you just get around that perimeter and you just walk. And the big guys, you know, the bigger you are, the better it is, right? So you just get like a float or something, and you lean down, and you're just, you know, like a mule. You're just, you're just pushing water, right? And you just get that thing going and going and going and going, and then you have somebody like your daddy or somebody holler, stop, you're making the water fall out the pool, right? And it's just like, eh, and then you got to look for your little cousin because they're probably going to drown. And anyway, you just got that thing going, all right? Now, once you get it really going, what do the kids and me, what do you like to do? You like to, right? And you're, you're right? And, and the little kids are holding on to the ladder, and they're just like, eh, you know? And so that's what you do, right? You instantly put your foot down and feel the wrath of that current. Well, did you know Satan and his army are just like that whirlpool? They want to push you to where they want you to go. And if you push against them, you're going to feel some resistance. In fact, you need to realize Christian life is a life of resistance. The Christian life is a life of resistance. It's a life of fighting. You see, the world wants you to go with the flow. The world wants you to just relax and go with the culture and look up and see where you are and then lay back down and just go with it, right? And Satan wants you to just relax and go with the world because the world is wicked and lost and if you remember it says this world and this age is Satan's domain he is the God of this broken world system so the prince of this wicked flow of worldliness of sin of, is Satan so he's relaxed go with the majority 
stop kicking, go with the easy life, just float around life. Because when you do that, you end up where Satan wants you. But Christians, what do we do? We are to just stand up when we see Satan and his army and the world or our own sinful desires trying to push us downstream. Do you know what we're called to do? We're called to put our feet down on the rock of Jesus and we are to stand our ground and we're to resist. Amen? Now let me ask my fellow whirlpool makers a, a question, okay? Once you stand against the current... And once you really start getting enough people walking against it, and it works better in a group, ain't it? It's almost like God designed things better in community. You notice that? Mm, there might be something there. But anyway, you notice when, when people are walking, what happens to that current? Gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it's gone. You could say the current flees. The current gets out of there. Church, as you successfully resist Satan, as you consistently stand your ground and stand against him, his pushing will start to grow weaker and weaker and weaker until he runs away defeated. Resist the devil and he will flee. Now, the Greek word in James 4, 7 is anthesomasia, okay, and I didn't pronounce that right, so don't copy me, all right, but it's a big A word with a bunch of little fancy little squigglies above the letters, all right, which means to set against, to withstand. Now, notice that's kind of two different words, withstand, that's kind of like standing against that whirlpool, but then there's set against, that seems a little different, Right? One of them seems a defensive posture, withstanding. One of them sees, seems an offensive posture to set against. Now, when we hear the word resist, we usually think of it from the defensive sense. We picture the devil attacking us, and resisting means standing firm. It means not backing down. It means not getting pushed around. It means remaining uncompromised and holy as we're being attacked. Now, that isn't wrong. Resist does have that defensive component to it. So when the Bible says resist the devil, it means that we are to stand firm, that we are not to back down, that we are not to be pushed around, that we are not to yield to the culture or to the world or to the politics or to popularity or anything. But the word resist does not mean, just mean, excuse me, being on the defensive it also means taking an offensive posture. You see, oftentimes resisting means going on the attack. You see, the Greek word for resist doesn't just mean to withstand an attack or an assault of being a victim. It also means to be set against, to be against, to be opposed to someone or something. So who should we be opposed to? We should be against, we should be opposed to Satan and his work and his plans and his mission and his agenda. And being opposed to him means playing both defense and offense. All right, well, let me explain, all right? Zachariah, you can come up here. Do we have, do we have any other volunteers? Who wants to be a volunteer today? Just show of hands, all right? You're not, the second one ain't going to do much. All right, Sebastian, come on up. All right, all right, come on down. All right, so Sebastian, once you get up here, you just stand right there. I don't need you for a while. So you just stand there as a statue, be on your best behavior, all right? All right, now, so now Zachariah just a man, all right, young man, and I am the devil, all right? He might think that, but not, okay, so I'm acting the part of the devil, okay? So I'm acting the devil, and all of a sudden I'm like, man, look, there's a person to prey on, time to steal, kill, and destroy. Hmm, let's see which tactic shall I use. I know. I'm going to do that old lion, you know. Hey, God doesn't love you. God, oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. He might be a Christian. He might be a Christian. This is in trouble. Uh, maybe, some, maybe some doubt. Maybe some doubt. God, God doesn't have a purpose or plan for you. That, that's for other people. That's, oh no, he's looking at, oh gosh, all right. All right, so the doubting, the, the lying, that ain't working. I know, I know. 
I can, it's things of the flesh. Some ladies, <laughs> ladies will get them, all right. <clears throat> hey, hot stuff, don't, don't, follow, don't follow Jesus, you don't have time for that, just follow the things of the flesh, hey, 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 but, oh, oh man, gosh, all right, gosh, that, was, that usually works, that usually works, all right. All right, here we go. This will get them. All right, hey, hey, it's all about the American dream. Listen, it's all about dollar, dollar bills, y'all, right here. It's all about the money. This can give you power. It can give you buy stuff. It's just so great. You just forget Jesus. Just forget this. Oh, he's thinking about it. Oh, okay. I got him thinking about that. He felt a little temptation, but he said no to that. All right, look. How about this? You're learning. Let's see what else I got. The lies. All right, so, so the lies didn't work. Doubting didn't work. Man, man, tap into the manliness, right? It's all about power. Look, this, this gun just symbolizes, all right? You need to put God. This world is against you. This world is opposed to you. You're a man. You need to stand up and take what is yours by power and by force. You need to just seize the world. It is The world is your oyster. It's there. And if you will just follow me and I will give you the power to conquer and to get everything. Oh, God. All right, man, all right, so now, notice, what was that? Was that defense or offense he was playing? That was defense, right? I was steady attacking him, and now I'm like, man, none of that worked, and so I'm, I'm fleeing. So now I'm like, ha-ha, look, there, there's somebody else. Come, come. There's somebody else. Now, if I'm like, ha, I know, let me, let me go stop with the lies. Oh, God. no, get out of the way. No, I got some lies to tell you. I got some light. I got some light. No, don't show him that. Don't listen to this. God doesn't love you. God doesn't love you. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Don't, 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 don't. God loves you. God doesn't love you. He hates you. You don't have a purpose. Ah, oh, that ain't working. Hey, hot stuff. Hey, hey. All right, push me. Hey, no. Get, I'm talking to him. Leave me alone. No. Leave me. Look, ah, oh, jeez. All right. Uh, he might take this. I, let, let's skip that one. I don't know. I didn't tell. I didn't tell Sebastian what I was playing ahead of time. He might be taking my twenty dollar bill. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. <laughs> Is it, block me, Zachary. Please block me with this one. All right. Oh no. Oh no. Oh man, money, money. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you, thank you. So y'all, y'all get the point, right? Let's give him a round of applause. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, what was Zachariah doing the second time? Was he on the defense or the offense? He was the offense, right? So that shows he was knowing my plan the same way Satan wants to stop and mess up the Great Commission. We should be actively looking to stop his mission to steal, kill, and destroy. And how do we do that? By making disciples, right? So you're like, ah, you know, each time another person converts to Christianity, each time somebody starts coming to church, each time somebody starts reading their Bible because you or me are pouring our lives into somebody and showing love, that is us actively resisting Satan and his kingdom. That's us going on the offense, amen? You see, we are all called by God to be a part of the resistance. We're not only to resist Satan's attacks, but we are to resist Satan and his evil works and his plans, and that means we are to go on the attack. Listen, listen to the definition of resistance. It says, the refusal to accept or comply with something, the attempt to prevent something by action or argument. So I don't know about you, but I don't just want the enemy not to attack me, and as long as he's not attacking me, I don't care, right? That, that's not me, and I don't think that's you either. I don't want to see him attack or harm any of you. 
I don't want to see him attack or harm any of my brothers and sisters in Christ, even the ones I don't know. As a matter of fact, I don't want the enemy and his army to have any success in their mission to steal, kill, or destroy. I don't want to see him harm anyone, even the person who is opposed to Christ, even the person who's opposed to the church. I don't want even to see the devil harm one hair on the head of an atheist or a self-proclaimed Satanist. I don't want to see the enemy have any victories. So we are supposed to be opposed to Satan and all of his dealings of evil. What about you, church? Are you in agreement with that? We want to resist all of his operations. We don't want to just wait for his attack and to rebuff the attacks. We want to go on the offensive and we want to be part of the resistance. So I would love to see HBC and every other church stand up to the wicked spirit. We should oppose his plans, his mission, his strategies. We are the resistance of the spread of evil. We are the resistance of the spread of darkness. We are the resistance, church. And resistance can be a defensive maneuver, as I said, such as resisting or withstanding the temptation to sin, resisting the pressure to conform to the world. But it also is an offensive maneuver, such as using God's Word to advance the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel and through making disciples. So that may be make, make you think, what does it look like to resist Satan in his kingdom of darkness on a practical level. It's simple. We are to live a life faithfully following Jesus in commands to his teachings and his uh, uh, just being obedient to him. And as we do that, as we're actively following Jesus, you know what you would do if you hear someone spreading lies and untruths? You lovingly spread truth. If you see someone causing harm, you lovingly intervene with justice. If you see someone in society tearing down godly things, you lovingly build it back up. If you see someone building up ungodly things, you lovingly go and tear it down. So how do you resist Satan? Simple. You reject what God rejects. You hate what God hates. You accept what God accepts, and you love what God loves. We are to resist hate with love. We are to resist lies with truth. We are to resist despair with hope. We are to resist the things of the world with the things of God. We are to resist the darkness with the light. We are to resist the devil with Jesus. We are to resist Satan. We are to be part of the resistance. We are to stand against Satan and the darkness as the light of the world. And that is how we resist, by being the light of the world and by boldly, uh, bolding shining the light. We don't hide it under a bushel basket, no, right, as the song goes. We are to shine the light of Jesus boldly into the darkness. Even the place that scares us and terrifies us and against the people that have nothing in common with us and that, that never would talk to us, we don't shy away from them and just talk to people like us and look like us and vote like us and smell like us and, and all of that. No, we are to shine the light of Jesus into each and every dark corner. And when we resist the devil, he will flee. When we resist the devil, he will flee. Church, James 4, 7 teaches us that we are to give everything to God and give nothing to Satan. We are to give everything to God and nothing to Satan. Submit to God and resist the devil. And you, when you do that, you know what ha will happen? Do you know what will happen? That old serpent will slither away. Because you know, Satan is nothing but a snake. And the thing about snakes, they have no arms and no feet. And that's because Satan has been disarmed and defeated. Amen? Amen. Yeah. That's right. I used the Facebook joke in my sermon. All right. And it was appropriate. It was appropriate, right? Satan is disarmed 
and defeated. So church, let's leave this place today remembering several things. Remember to rest in your identity in Christ. Remember that you are fighting from a place um, of victory and not for victory. Remember to give God your everything. And remember, you are part of the resistance. So you remember these things, and I promise you that you will win battle after battle, and eventually you will win the war. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for these wonderful things to remember. Uh, Father, let us rest in them. Let us rest in the identity of who we are. Let us just rest in what you say, not what the world says, not what even our own sinful flesh and our weaknesses say, but let us stand in your truth of what you say of who we are and in the truth that Jesus has won the victory. And let us just understand that we are to fully just submit to you, to give you everything, and then we are to boldly resist. We are to go on the defensive. We are to resist attacks. But we're also to unite together as the church and go on the offensive to be the light of Christ, to shine brightly for your name. So, Father God, I just pray. I just pray that you help us be the church. Help us to be who you saved us to be, who you created us to be, who the Holy Spirit empowers us to be. Father, let us leave this place. Let us go into battle. And we already thank you for the victory. In your son's name we pray. Amen.